Recently, someone sent me a document, and as I printed it out, I noticed, as I've done many times before, that this document had a page number on every page, but it also had the total number of pages. For example, it said this is page three of five. I'm sure you've seen that happen. As I looked at it this week, I thought, maybe I should do that with my sermons. Maybe I should say, this is two of three, because what I'm doing is a little unusual. I don't plan to do that from now on, but I do in this series because I'm doing something I do not recall ever having done before, and I've been at this for a few years. Namely, we've been studying the book of Numbers on Wednesday night, and as we've gone through the book of Numbers, it has occurred to me that some of the sins committed by the ancient Israelites are very common among believers today. So I thought, uh, I hate to repeat for those who come on Wednesday night, but everybody needs to hear this. So I decided to take <clears throat> three sins that are mentioned in the book of Numbers and do a short series on those three common sins that we all commit. Last time, we covered the first one, which is simply being discontent. Uh, we are not happy with the way things are going. The second one I'd like to deal with is a little more serious in a sense, and maybe in another sense it's not, given the punishment that was deal dished out for these. But the next one is criticism. I think that is um, sort of common among believers, and not just believers, but a lot of people, would you say? But the question is, what does God think about criticism? What is criticism? Is there a legitimate criticism? Is there one that is not legitimate? Well, all of those are the questions that I would like to address. So let's begin by looking at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. In chapter 11, they are complaining. In chapter 12, a couple of them are criticizing. So let's begin by looking at verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. There is more to the story, which we'll get to, but let me pause here and just describe the criticism that's going on. It needs a little bit of explanation. So go back to verse 1. Notice it says, then Marion and Aaron. Anything strike you as uh, significant about that? Well, it might not, but many who study the scriptures think that it is because Marion's name is first. And when that happens, it's usually significant. Not always, but sometimes. For example, if you read the book of Acts carefully, you will see that it starts out talking about Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. Then all of a sudden, it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. So that a subtle way of Luke saying that at the beginning, Barnabas was the leader, which is clearly the case. Humanly speaking, had there been no Barnabas, there would have been no Paul. But eventually, Paul becomes the leader. Well, if that's a clue here, then Moses is deliberately putting Miriam's name first. That is significant. Now, um, I need to tell you a little bit about this. 
Uh, you know who Miriam is? You know who Miriam is? It's Moses' sister. Do you know who Aaron is? Moses, well, you knew that more than Aaron, Miriam. That's right. It's his brother. So both of them are criticizing Moses. They both spoke against Moses. Uh, and here's the complaint. She married an, he married an Ethiopian woman. Wow. So what's wrong with that? Well, uh, let me point out that I said that Miriam's name was first. She's the leader in this. And not just because her name is first, but you know where it says spoke? In the Hebrew text, it's in the feminine. Now, we don't have masculine and feminine in English, but they do in Hebrew and in Greek. And uh, that indicates she's the one that's speaking this. And furthermore, as we dig into the passage, we discover that she gets the more severe punishment. So clearly she's the leader in this, and it has to do with her brother's marriage. So what's all that about? Uh, and by the way, how did Aaron get in on this? Well, he probably just went along with it. Matter of fact, there are indications of that. Do you remember when Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments and he came down and they, were, they had the golden calf? Aaron went along with it, of all people. Aaron goes along with it. So Sister Miriam is complaining and he just goes along with it, which seems to be maybe one of the characteristics of his life. But the issue is, why are they complaining about Moses marrying an Ethiopian. Now this gets to be real interesting because this is an awful late time in Moses' life to say something. He got married years before. She just now decides to criticize. Now that little observation has led many to the conclusion that this is probably not his first marriage. It could be, and they get all balled up in the fact that it says she was an Ethiopian, but that word means a Cushite, and his first wife was from Midian, but that is called the land of Cush, so it could be. But there are other indications that it's more likely a second wife. Matter of fact, the very repetition in verse 1, Moses, because he married an Ethiopian, for he married an Ethiopian. The fact that it's repeated twice is indicating it's recent. And when you put this in the time frame of his life, that certainly fits. Now, uh, at this point, Moses is uh, a little better than 80 years old. Uh, he uh, was married earlier, much earlier. He lived a total of 120 years. But he wrote Psalm 90 and talked about the fact that the average lifespan was 70. So many putting all that together suggest that it's very possible that his first wife died of old age. He was old enough. And Moses got married again. Now, that second marriage is what's causing the criticism. Now, the question is, well, why are they criticizing Moses for getting married a second time? Matter of fact, there's nothing about this second marriage, even as to an Ethiopian, that's wrong. Up until this point, God forbid Israelites to marry Canaanites. But there was nothing that said he could not marry somebody from Ethiopia. So that in and of itself isn't worthy of criticism. So you read this verse and you ask, why are they criticizing Moses for getting married? Even if it's a second time. That wasn't wrong either, in and of itself. Well, we gotta keep digging. Look at verse two. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken through Moses only? Has he not spoken through us also? Oh, wait a minute. We're getting a little further into the story, and it's not just his marriage that they're criticizing. It's his authority. 
It's his leadership. And that suggests, the way it's stated, <laughs> clearly suggests that what's really going on here is they're jealous. Look at what it says. Well, you know, he spoke through Moses. Well, he also spoke through us. Now, what does that say? They are jealous. Now, if you put this in the context, in the flow of the book of Numbers, you will recall that in chapter 11, Moses complained that he couldn't possibly do all that he was responsible for. So God took 70 men, called elders, he took the spirit off of Moses, and he gave the same spirit to those 70. That is probably the backdrop of what's going on. Oh, I mean, there are others. Well, God spoke through us too, remember that. And so they start criticizing Moses. And then Miriam, whom I suggested is leading this criticism, throws in and, yeah, he got married. Well, now, perhaps, based on verse 2, the criticism is she's a little jealous of the second wife. Now, if you read the writings of Moses carefully, it becomes apparent that Miriam was one of the leaders. She was probably the foremost female leader at the time. Perhaps she's jealous that this second wife might <clears throat> take over somehow. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Has a second marriage ever caused other people to get jealous ever? That's as old as Moses. She did, and that's probably what's going on. So, somebody has said, envy, perhaps, simmering for a long time, now comes to the surface. This has probably been going on for some time, and it now bubbles to the top. So, what's going on here is that Miriam is a prophetess, Aaron is the high priest, but they're losing their distinctiveness. The Lord has now appointed 70 others, and they're feeling the pressure. And so out of perhaps jealousy, they are criticizing Moses. Now, let's talk about criticism for a minute. What is criticism? Well, it's actually the practice of judging the merits or faults of something. It is a judging. Criticism is judging. Now, we talk about different kinds of criticism. We talk about a uh, positive criticism or a negative criticism. You ever heard the expression, I'm sure you have, that was a constructive criticism? Does that mean there's a destructive criticism? Hmm. Yes. All right. This then is clearly a destructive criticism. Given what the text says, not only in these verses, but the verses to follow, it is apparent that this one is destructive. But there's more to the story. At the end of verse 2, it says, And the Lord heard it. Now, does the Lord hear everything? Yes. Of course. Why does that have to be put in here? Because he's saying, and the Lord doesn't like it. He's not just saying the Lord heard the speaking. He's saying, the Lord heard it all right, and he wasn't too happy about it. You know, like two kids saying to each other, Mama heard that. You know, that doesn't mean she just got the message. It means she's not real happy about what's going on. Then, almost as if it's out of place, verse 3 says, And Moses was very humble. Matter of fact, he was more humble than all the men on the face of the earth. Now that calls for some discussion because some people have taken that to say, Aha! Moses didn't write numbers. He never would have said that of himself. 
Well, I'm not sure that's true, especially if he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told him to write this down. But why did the Holy Spirit tell him to write it down? Because that's significant to the story. Is he guilty of anything? No, he's not only not guilty of what he's being charged with, a second marriage and somehow being the only one God speaks through, but uh, he's humble. Matter of fact, he's very humble. Matter of fact, he's more humble than all the people on the earth. That particular Hebrew word can also be translated meek. And that's the way we often think of it, the meek Moses. Now, I think there's some real truth here. Do you remember as we went through numbers that there was a time when God said, matter of fact, recently, Moses, stand back. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to start all over and I'm going to build a nation out of you. Remember that? And what was Moses' response? <laughs> Glad to see you picked the right person to take over. <laughs> Not at all. What a great opportunity to say, wow, I really get to be the big cheese now. He said the exact opposite. He then pleaded for the Lord not to take their life. He pleaded for them. The point I'm making is that when he could have exalted himself, he humbled himself. He was indeed a meek man, a humble man before God. So, the text is telling us he's not guilty. The Lord is telling us he isn't guilty of any of this. This is not constructive criticism. It's the kind of criticism that should never have happened in the first place. And to make it worse, it's coming from his own family. Somebody has said sometimes the unkindness of our friends is a greater trial of our meekness than the malice of our enemies. True, isn't it? Sometimes enemies can criticize you and you can brush it off. It's when those who are close to you criticize you that it hurts the worst. So, the point being, Moses got criticized. That's the point. Ever been criticized? Let me ask it another way. Anybody here who's never been criticized? <laughs> Part of life, isn't it? And especially if you have any position of leadership, then you're a target. It just goes with the territory. So if you ever get criticized, and it's unjust criticism, I want you to remember what? Jesus. You know what they said about him? They said that he was a wine-bibber and a glutton. Can you imagine calling Jesus a wine-bibber and a glutton? Why did he do that? Because he went and ate with sinners, that's why. That was an unfair criticism. They not only gave an unfair criticism to Moses, an unfair criticism to Jesus, but they apparently did the same thing to the Apostle Paul, and that one were notes, that one's worthy of a note. Put your finger in Numbers 12, we're coming back, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you've been criticized, you're going to appreciate me showing you this passage. Matter of fact, at the men's breakfast yesterday, I, um, in just conversation, we were discussing things, I mentioned this passage, and a man there said, i got to have that. What was the reference to that? <laughs> he plans to use it. Well, you may find this very handy. Look at 1 Corinthians 4.1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of a steward that one be found faithful. But with me... It is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. 
For I know of nothing against myself. Yet I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. You need that? Did you write that down? Take a note and put it in a blank page in the back of your Bible. Criticism. Unjust criticism of me. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4. By the way, read the next verse. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, one of the scariest verses in the Bible, and reveal the counsels of the heart. Wow. Then each one's praise will come from God. Wow. All right. My point is, so far, real simple. Moses was unjustly criticized. Let's go back to Numbers 12. At this point, the Lord decides that he wants to have a little conversation with Miriam and Aaron. So picking the story up in verse 4, we are told, Suddenly, <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. And so the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. Now, the first verse and three quarters is telling us about the criticism. Beginning at the end of verse 2 and going down through verse 9, we're going to have this little conversation. Uh, with uh, <clears throat> the Lord and the critics. The text says, suddenly. That word actually means suddenly and surprisingly. I think they were a little surprised that the Lord showed up. So he said, all right, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, front and center, meet you at the tabernacle. By the way, Aaron's name is first this time. Probably indicate that he was involved in this. And someone suggested maybe he's the one that fostered the attitude. She was a little more severe with it, but he was in there. So they meet. And then they're standing there, probably breast, shoulder to shoulder. And the Lord says to Aaron and Miriam, step forward. Can you get, I mean, this whole thing sounds, did you ever get called to the office? Some of you even look guilty. You know, when you were in school, did they ever say, you need to go, you need to, they're warning you in the principal's office, that ever happened to you? Or even maybe at work, the boss wants to see you in his office, boom, what did I do? Well, this is like that times a whole lot more. Step forward, you two, we're going to have a conversation. Now, what he does is he explains to them the special place that Moses had. Now, I find this passage very helpful. Um, matter of fact, years ago, when I was a young Christian and I was first studying the scripture, uh, th there was an issue, I forgot now how it came up, but the Bible in the New Testament talks about prophets. And the, the question was, what is a prophet? And at one point, somebody told me it was just preaching or foretelling rather than foretelling. And I remember trying to fit that in some passages and it didn't quite fit to my satisfaction. 
And then I found this passage in Numbers chapter 12. I've used it many times since. Would you like to know what a prophet is? By the way, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard anybody claim they, they were a prophet or a prophetess? You ever heard somebody say uh, a, another Christian had a, had a prophecy? Well, you haven't lived until that happens. All right, let me tell you what a prophet is according to the Lord. Look at verse 6. He says, here now, translated, I want you to listen to me very carefully. He's very angry. He says that in verse 9. And he says, I speak to prophets. And when I do, I speak to them in a vision or in a dream. I want to make an observation or two about that. A prophet in the scripture is someone who receives direct revelation from the Lord. And that direct revelation is in the form of a dream or a vision. Dreams happen at night. Visions are what happen in the daytime. Now, tuck that away somewhere as you read the Bible. Because as you go through the Old Testament... The prophets are called seers. You ever see that in the scripture? What's a seer? Someone who sees a dream or a vision. That's the nature of a biblical prophet. Now, this is, I don't have the time to go into this, uh, but I am of the opinion that there, are, there is evidence that the gift of prophets has ceased, at least for the time being. Uh, let me, let me just mention one verse that leads me to that conclusion. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people. There were false prophets among the people, as, even as there will be false teachers among you. So, Peter says, as there were, past tense, false prophets, there will be false teachers. And they will be false prophets. That's in the past. What's going to happen next is false teachers. At any rate, the critical issue is this. To be a biblical prophet, you must receive direct revelation from the Lord. It is not foretelling like preaching. It is foretelling. And in the form of a vision or a dream. Now, look at verse 8. I speak to Moses face to face, plainly, and not in dark sayings. Wow, what do you mean face to face? Wow, thought the Lord was a spirit. Nobody could see him. That's true. Matter of fact, he clarifies in verse 8, Moses sees the form of the Lord. So, the Lord is saying, here's what a prophet is, and here is Moses, and he is radically different than a prophet. So he says, here's how. In the first place, I speak to him face to face. That is not to be taken literally. God doesn't have a literal face. It is a figure of speech. It means... Uh, we came and talked. Moses heard an audible voice. There was no intermediary. There was no mediator between the two. The two of them had a direct personal conversation. Furthermore, he says, I speak plainly, meaning uh, there's no go-between, and I don't speak in dark sayings. I don't give him riddles. I speak just very bluntly. I tell him exactly what I mean, what I say. There's nothing about that communication that isn't plain and clear, personal and direct. So, the Lord is saying, All right, Miriam, you were a prophetess, you had a prophecy, but that's different than Moses. So he says, verse 8, Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses, seeing the distinct position I have given him? Why would you not be afraid 
to criticize him. So, the text says he was very angry. Now, if you're reading the book of Numbers like it was originally written with no chapter divisions or verse divisions, you would read in chapter 11 that they were not happy. That in chapter 11, they were complaining. Remember that? And you keep reading in chapter 12, and now they are criticizing. That's important. There's a difference. I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But the point is, in both cases, the Lord is not happy with either one. That was very clear about complaining. And it's now clear the Lord gets angry at unjust, improper criticism. You know, I think all of us criticize it sometime. Some people criticize more than others. And one pastor said to me once, there are people in my church who have the gift of criticism. They think it's their God-given ability to criticize. You know anybody that thinks they have the gift of criticism? They are constantly criticizing. Well, I want you to know when it's not proper to criticize, and there is a time when it's proper, we'll get to that. But when it's not, God does not like it. Should I say that again? Did that come across? Let me tell you what the text says. God got angry. Wow. Now, the third and last part of this passage are the consequences of what's going on. So let's pick it up in verse 10. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Miriam, I'm sorry, Aaron said to Moses, Oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as a one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of the mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, Please heal her, O oh God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp, and seven days and afterwards she should be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in again. Whoa! Here's the consequences. The judgment of God fell on Miriam. And that's what leads Bible students to the conclusion she was the leader in this. And that's why we, I said in verse 1, she was the instigator. It was her jealousy over Mary, uh, Moses' wife and his leadership that really was the big issue. She was dissatisfied with her divinely appointed place in the nation of Israel. And she was complaining about it. So God's punishment was she became leprous, which in the Bible is a symbol of sin. Now that is really interesting. Do you remember Moses having a, prophecy, a problem with this? Do you remember? When God said, hey Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses said, oh, oh, not me. I mean, I, I, not, I, mean, I can't do that. And the Lord said, Moses, stick your hand in your coat, your vest. And he stuck his hand in it. He says, now pull it out. Remember this? It's in Exodus 4. The hand was leprous. The Lord said, stick it back in. He stuck it back in. It came out white. So it's rather interesting to me that when you doubt Moses' ability, if you're even Moses, the punishment is leprosy. And that's what it was for her. So, 
Moses came down out of the mountain after seeing the glory of the Lord and his face shone and they put a veil over his face. Miriam now needs a veil to hide her sin and shame. She's leprous. So Aaron says to Moses, Oh, don't let this come upon us. He thinks he's next. Uh, we, we spoke foolishly. Uh, so he says, look, pray, pray, pray this doesn't happen. And, and pray she gets healed. By the way, who is Aaron? What's his position? High priest. What does a high priest do? What does priest do? Intercedes, right? So he's now saying, Moses, you've got to do something. You pray that this, you heal her. And so, uh, we don't want her like one that is, look at the end of verse 12. It comes out of her mother's womb. Uh, the idea here is, uh, we don't want her flesh to decay like a baby that comes out stillborn. He's afraid worse things will happen to her, and he might get it too. So, we are told, Moses prayed. They're questioning his leadership and his position. And he ends up interceding directly for this, which is what Aaron should have done. So the Lord said, all right, I'll heal her. But uh, if her father had spit in her face, would she not be ashamed? What is that about? Now, spitting in the face was an act of contempt. The person was despicable. So if a father spit on a daughter's face, he was doing that as an act of contempt to her. So the Lord says, uh, and if that happened, she'd be unclean for seven days. So I'll tell you what, the punishment's going to be for seven days. And at the end of seven days... Uh, she can come back to the camp. Now, lepers had to go out of the camp, so she was going to be out of the camp for seven days, but at the end of seven days, she can come back. But what is interesting to me is it says, huh, the, look at verse 15. The people did not journey until she came back to the camp. That says to me, other people can be affected by your criticism. Other people were affected. The whole nation didn't move until we dealt with this problem. Point of this is, criticism has consequences. So don't embarrass yourself. Wouldn't it be interesting if everybody who criticized all of a sudden turned leprous? <laughs> that would really be interesting, wouldn't it? It's what I've often said and so have others about Ananias and Sapphira. If in the church meeting all the liars killed over and died, well, how, the, how would that affect the attendance? Um, I mean, if everybody just criticized, had a leprous hand, boy, would that be interesting. So just be careful. Don't be careful of criticizing. Don't criticize unjustly. All right, let's talk about that. What's going on in this passage? is Miriam and Aaron criticize Moses and the Lord punishes Miriam with leprosy and when Moses intercedes for her, she gets healed. So in the context of the book of Numbers, especially in light of what happened in chapter 11, I think the point of this chapter is that it's a vindication of Moses. His divine leadership is supported. And just because 70 others are given his spirit doesn't mean that he's not still in charge. So in Numbers 11, people complained. In Numbers 12, they criticized. Complaining is an expression of discontent, perhaps of resentment. Criticism is passing judgment. In its negative sense, it is fault-finding. So in chapter 11, the issue was they are complaining because they're not content. In this chapter, 
they are criticizing because they're not at peace with the place God gave them in his work. So I'd like to take a minute before I close and talk about constructive criticism and negative criticism. We need to discuss what is judging and what is proper judgment and improper judgment. And this frankly can be very confusing because in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, judge not or you'll be judged with the same judgment and certainly don't judge if you're a hypocrite. Don't judge other people what you're guilty of. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, you're at to be blamed, the church at Corinth, because you did not judge. So very clearly, the Bible teaches there's a proper judgment and there's an improper judgment. What's the difference? Well, let's analyze judging. This is very important. In order for there to be a judgment, there needs to be three items. First of all, there needs to be a standard. Some standard by which you judge something. Secondly, there needs to be a case that's being judged. We have to take an incident and put it up against the standard to see if it measures up. And thirdly, there needs someone to pass the judgment, namely a judge or a critic. Now there is a sense in the Bible where judgment is legit. I just mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul censors the Corinthians because they did not judge a brother who was living in sin. So when is it proper to judge? And the answer is, when there is a standard, a proper standard. And for us, that's the scripture. The scripture is the standard. Is it biblical? Secondly, you've got to have a case. So whatever the issue is, get the facts first. Matter of fact, the Bible is very emphatic about this. Before you judge something, maybe sure you've got two or three witnesses. People are allowed due process. They are innocent before proven guilty. Our whole judicial system is built on this biblical value system. So there needs to be a proper case. And then you have to ask, is it your place to judge? I think there are times when it, you have that proper right and there are times when you don't. To take a simple illustration, the Bible says don't steal. So if you're working in a place or, and you know somebody has stolen, you have every right to say, I'm making a judgment, call it criticism, that's wrong. You stole, you should not have done that. Just make sure you get the facts first. Now, there are two areas in which the scripture demands, commands us to judge. Doctrine and conduct. Make sure you have the facts first. But you have every responsibility to judge false doctrine and false behavior. So, <clears throat> you have the right to judge those things. Then what is an improper judgment? And the answer is, anytime you have a wrong standard, you don't have a factual case, and it wasn't your place to judge that in the first place. So, a simple illustration is, we have man-made rules, and we decide people are not spiritual because they didn't match up to our rules. Well, in the first place, that's not the right standard. It's a man-made mandate, not a God-given command. In the second place, the person isn't guilty, and you shouldn't be judging things like that in the first place. One of the best illustrations of this I've ever had is years ago, a lady said to me that a couple in the church was having an affair. And I was a bit taken back by that. And I said, how do you know that? And she said, it's the way they look at each other. Now, there may have been a little something going on, but to jump to the conclusion 
that they were having an affair based on just the way they look at each other is a criticism that is not right. Now we could go on and on and on. Just remember these three things. Standard, case, are you the proper judge? I hear people judge other couples by the way they're rearing their children. Some of that may be legit. Sometimes I think it's not your place to decide that. What they are doing in their case isn't biblical or non-biblical. It just is the way they're doing it, and it's none of your business. I think we are too quick to judge each other on things that's none of our business. As you know, I traveled for a number of years as a special speaker, as an evangelist, and as a Bible teacher. Traveled all over the United States. I've been in, I have no idea how many churches. And I remember at the end of that thinking, if I could collect all the Christians in something like the Colosseum, and I knew they were saved, that wasn't the issue. But I could pick one subject that I would speak to them on that I see in church after church after church that is detrimental to their spiritual life and the spiritual life of that church. If I could have one such sermon, I'd preach on judging. It's epidemic in the body of Christ. Some of it's legit, but a whole lot of it is not. And we need to be very careful. Make sure you have the facts first. That's probably the single most important thing I could say. A careful female driver was stopped by a police car. A cameraman pulled up in another car to snap a picture of the officer giving the driver a white box. Congratulations, madam, the policeman said. You are the first woman to receive an Orchid for Safe Driving Week. We have been following you for some time and want to commend you for observing all the traffic laws. Her picture was in the paper the next day with the caption, She appeared quite nervous while receiving the Orchid. Nervous was hardly the word for it. Actually, her driver's license had expired and she was driving without a license. The policeman didn't have all the facts and made an improper judgment. Let's pray.